morning, everyone. I want to welcome all of us at West Park Church, those here in person as well as those joining us online. Now, what a delight to hear our West Park kids sing today. And now the Christmas spirit has uh, truly arrived at West Park. And I can't wait for all that this season holds and the incredible ministry opportunities that are ahead of us. So we are praying that God will give us a great harvest during this Advent season. And just a reminder about uh, the announcement you heard. Tonight is our all-church prayer meeting. Uh, in his famous devotional, My Atmos for His Highest, Oswald Chambers wrote, Prayer does not equip us for greater works. Prayer is the greater work. And that's what we're going to do this evening. I can't think of anything more important in the life of the church than us coming together for prayer. So let's collectively pray together this evening to engage in the greater work, and I guarantee uh, you will be blessed. Today I'm continuing our sermon series, Unwrapping Spiritual Gifts. And in this series, we're focusing on the spiritual gifts that are essential for a healthy church. And so far, we have covered the gifts of encouragement, serving, giving, evangelism. You know, all these are essential gifts to strengthen the church. And today, I'm going to dive into something controversial, add some spice for what's life without spice. So as you reflect on the spiritual gifts listed in the Bible, it's probably been on your mind. You've been wondering about it, which is why I believe it's important that we have this conversation. Now, I'm talking about the sign gifts, prophecy, tongues, and healing. Now, who's excited you're in church today? <laughs> Put on your seat belts. <laughs> We're going to wade into controversial territory Today will be more of a teaching, not the regular way I preach. But it's good for us to grapple with these hard subjects. You know, it ensures, first of all, that we don't shy away from the hard topics. If it is in the Bible, we talk about it. And secondly, it addresses the diversity of our congregation. We have people from different backgrounds and denominations who are part of West Park. And we celebrate the diversity. We love it. And my heart as your pastor is that uh, we will have unity and not division on these matters. You know, it's easy for church to have these little theological camps within, and that is not healthy. See, in the essentials of our faith, we need to be on the same page. We cannot compromise on the essentials. But there are those non-essential subjects where we have the freedom to hold different opinions. We can still worship together. We're still brothers and sisters in Christ because we have more in common than what separates us. So keeping that in mind, now let's talk about these three specific sign gifts that are listed by the Apostle Paul and how they work today. So I'm referring to prophecy, tongues, and healing. Now we're going to touch on many Bible passages today, but let's uh, read 1 Corinthians 12, 7 to 11 together so if you're physically able, I'll ask you to stand as we honor the reading of God's Word. The text is from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 to 11. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. To another, a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one Spirit, to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and to still another the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and He distributes them to each one just as He determines. Will you pray with me? Father, we commit our teaching moment into your hands. Thank you that you, Holy Spirit, are our teacher. So now I pray that you will minister to us, that there will be unity, there will be understanding. We pray that, Lord, that you will uh, help us to have receptive hearts, open to what you have to say to us. 
So we commit this time into your hands, and we ask this in the powerful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. A story is told of a, a psychiatrist who had a patient who thought he was dead. No amount of arguments could convince this guy. He was sure he was dead. So the psychiatrist came up with a brilliant plan. He decided to prove to the patient that dead people don't bleed. So the doctor gave the patient all kinds of articles and medical journals to read on this topic. And he set up an appointment the following week. So the patient did his due diligence, did all the reading that was required of him. And the next appointment, the psychiatrist asked him, what did you discover from your reading? The patient uh, replied, I discovered medical evidence proves that dead people don't bleed. And the psychiatrist asked, are you really sure? And the patient says, absolutely. There's a stack of evidence to prove this point. So that was the moment the psychiatrist was waiting for. So he took a, a sharp pin, poked the patient's fingers, and a drop of blood appeared. The patient looked at his finger in horror and replied, Oh my goodness, dead people do bleed. <laughs> now I'm telling that story to help us to understand how we all have this nature to justify what we believe. Uh, my encouragement today, especially as we come to subjects like this, is no matter what your position has been previously, uh, come with this uh, open mind to hear from what God has to say afresh from His Word. And more importantly, don't allow your experience to dictate your belief, but let God's Word be the standard. You know, what the Bible teaches must be elevated about our personal experience. Now, people who live in the Western world are generally skeptical of the supernatural. This is not the case if you come from other parts of the world where Supernatural experiences are not frowned upon. It's seen as part of life. Now, the Apostle Paul himself does not distinguish between the natural and the supernatural gifts. They're all supernatural because all spiritual gifts come from the Holy Spirit. They're all spirit-induced. So even putting some gifts in a separate category is questionable. Now let me state this clearly up front. When we take the Bible as God's Word, we accept the supernatural. God is a miracle-working God. He always has been and He always will be, yesterday, today, and forever. So we don't question His ability to do miracles. A liberal Christianity may question that, and we don't want anything to do with that. So the question, can God do miracles, is settled. No doubt He is able, and Bible-believing Christians will Agree to that. Now, the greater question relating to spiritual gifts is, are these sign gifts active in the church today? Are there some of us with the gifts of prophecy, tongues, healing? Now, evangelical Christians have two broad positions on this matter. A well-meaning, devoted Christians, committed followers of Christ, disagree on this issue. Now, the two broad camps are the cessationists and the continuationists. The cessationists argue that the sign gifts like tongues, prophecy, and healing were active only in the first century church. They primarily authenticated the apostles as messengers from God. They validated their claims. And once the canon of Scripture, the 66 books of the Bible, were given to us, we no longer need these sign gifts, so they disappear. As cessationists don't deny that God can do miracles, they just don't believe that sign gifts exist any longer and operate in the church today. An often cited reference from cessationists is 1 Corinthians 13, 8 to 10. Listen to this. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, 
But when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. Now, according to many cessationists, the completeness here is referring to the canon of Scripture, the inspired 66 books of the Bible. Uh, this is now complete, and therefore, there's no need for these sign gifts to operate in the church. Now, that is one view held by Christians who love Jesus and are devoted in their faith. And some of you here at West Park may hold on to this position. Now, the other view is the continuationists, and their argument is the gifts of the Lord are irrevocable. They are given for the building of the body. So it is an arbitrary distinction to say some gifts have ceased while some operate in the church. So there is no scriptural evidence according to continuationists that God has somehow withdrawn these miraculous gifts. So in the book of Acts, as you read, you will see it's not just the apostles who engage in the supernatural work, but people like Philip and Stephen, who were not apostles, were also used by God in that way. So continuationists would challenge the cessationist interpretation of 1 Corinthians 13. Now look at that set of verses again. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. So what is the completeness referring to? Now, continuationists would say that completeness here is not referring to the canon of Scripture, but it's talking about the second coming of Jesus, seeing Jesus face to face. That's when all of these gifts will cease because there's no more need to build the body of Christ because we will be perfect when Jesus returns. So gifts of knowledge, prophecy, tongues, all will eventually cease, but until Christ appears, they have a role in the church today. Now, if you ask me personally, the way I read the Scripture and the way I interpret it, I would say I'm a continuationist. Now, I believe all of the gifts are available at God's discretion, and He is the one who distributes it as He sees fit. And some other uh, contemporary Christian figures who are continuationists would be John Piper, Wayne Grudem, uh, John Stott, Francis Chan, uh, Sam Storms, Matt Chandler. Uh, you may recognize some of these names. Now, if you belong to the, the cessationist camp and you believe that they have valid arguments, you know, that should not stop you from fellowshipping with others who believe that the gifts are active. See, there are some non-essential issues around which we can disagree and still respect each other, love each other, and worship together. Now, it is unfortunate when churches start dividing themselves based on these issues and forget the more important teaching about love. Now, when spiritual gifts are used in an orderly manner, in the way God intended it, following the protocol outlined in the New Testament, it is beneficial to the church. It's good. But when it is used in a disorderly manner, it has the potential to hurt the church. So some forms of Christianity that believe in the sign gifts are in danger of extremism, allowing experiences to take over, to put undue emphasis on signs and wonders, elevate the gifts over the giver, and it becomes chaotic. There are no caution being exercised, and as a result, they end up hurting the body. Now, at the same time, we should be careful not to brushstroke everyone who is a continuationist and put them in this category of extremism. There is a place for cautious, Scripture-directed expression of the sign gifts that can build the body of Christ. Now, I believe we need to be open to the continuation of the gifts, but we also need a, a thoughtful, biblically grounded approach in exercising those gifts. So with this extended background information, let me address three gifts in particular, prophecy, 
tongues, and healing. Let's start with prophecy. Let me read some verses from 1 Corinthians 14 that provide some crucial insights on the use of this gift in the church. Now, we don't have a lot of time, so I'll clarify to you what the gift is and then offer some practical guidance on how that gift can be used in the church. Now, in 1 Corinthians 14, Paul compares prophecy and tongues. And this is what he writes in verse 1. Follow the way of love and eagerly desire gifts of the Spirit, especially prophecy. Now, he's here as he's building this discussion. Paul is laying the foundation. Love is the hallmark of the faith. That's something to keep in mind. When churches argue and get upset with one another over the use of spiritual gifts, they're failing to operate in love. We need to keep that in mind. Now, let's continue to read the next few verses, 2 to 5. For anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to people, but to God. Indeed, no one understands them. They utter mysteries by the Spirit. But the one who prophesies speaks to people for their strengthening, encouraging, and comfort. Anyone who speaks in a tongue edifies themselves, but the one who prophesies edifies the church. Now, I would like every one of you to speak in tongues, but I would rather have you prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues unless someone interprets so that the church may be edified. So prophecy is presented here in the Scripture as a gift that builds and edifies the whole church. It strengthens, encourages, and comforts. All positive. So Paul values prophecy more than tongues in the corporate worship experience. He's saying, I would rather have you prophesy because everybody can understand what you say and they can benefit from it. So he urges the Corinthians to eagerly desire the gift of prophecy. So what is prophecy? Prophecy is a revelation prompted by the Holy Spirit. Divinely inspired impressions that the Spirit leads us to speak out. Now, this revelation does not add to the 66 books of the Bible. It's not inspired in that sense. The Bible is sufficient. The canon of Scripture is closed. We're not adding any new doctrinal revelation to the Bible. See, that will ease some of you who feel uptight about this. Modern-day use of the gift of prophecy does not replace or add to the Scripture. But through this gift, God offers His children a personal consolation or encouragement. And through this, we experience the reality of God's presence, that He's not far away or removed, but He is active in our midst. He's involved in our lives. And it's one of the ways God speaks to us today. Now look at what Paul says in verses 24 and 25 of 1 Corinthians 14. But if an unbeliever or an inquirer comes in while everyone is prophesying, they are convicted of sin and are brought under judgment by all as the secrets of their hearts are laid bare. So they will fall down and worship God, exclaiming, God is really among you. So you can hear in this verse, what Paul is saying. There is a, a revelation component that is attached to prophecy that speaks to a person's individual situation. And there is a connection between prophecy and preaching. In fact, I believe it's one of the primary ways the gift of prophecy is in operation in our corporate worship experience. And God places promptings in the heart of the preacher and these are impressions the Spirit puts on the preacher's heart through the process of preparation. It can also be spontaneous. You know, it may not be in the notes of the preacher, but in the preaching moment, God may plant a thought in the preacher's mind. Now, either way, the message resonates with people. The sermon comes alive, and people in the congregation feel that message is for me. Now, I tell you, it's happened to me numerous times. And after preaching, people will come and say, it felt like you were just talking to me. 
That's exactly what I needed to hear from God. How do you know my story? And my response is, oh, we have these little spies running around in the church who gather all these uh, inside information, and that's how I craft my sermons. No, we have no spies here. Now, I have no clue what your week was like, but the Holy Spirit of God knows. He puts the thoughts in the preacher's mind that somebody needs to hear, and they are edified and strengthened in the process as the message comes alive in your heart. God gets all the credit for that. This is not about the preacher. This is about God working through the preacher, through the agency of preaching. So there is a true story from the life of Charles Spurgeon, the prince of preachers. He shares about this remarkable experience during his preaching. In one of his sermons, Spurgeon broke off from his subject, pointed in a direction and said, young man, the gloves you're wearing have not been paid for. You have stolen them from your employer. At the end of the service, a young man comes up, and he's all pale and agitated, and he wanted to speak to Spurgeon personally. And he said, sir, it's the first time I stole something. I'll never do it again. Please don't expose me, will you? That is the impression of the Spirit. Spirit inspired revelation in operation through preaching. And ironically, Spurgeon was a cessationist. But unbeknownst to him, the gift of prophecy was in operation. In fact, he recounts a number of times when it happened like that, when he was prompted to say words that resonated personally with somebody who's sitting in the congregation. And that's exactly what the Apostle Paul is saying in 1 Corinthians 14. People's secrets are laid bare, and they bow down and recognize God is in this place. The gift of prophecy has also a personal dimension. There may be spirit-prompted impressions, nudges, that God may want you to share with someone personally. Someone looks discouraged, and God may give you words to speak to them that uplifts them. God may lay something on your heart to share with another person that is profoundly impactful to them. And here is a caution when you exercise that gift. The Old Testament prophets said, thus says the Lord, and they were declaring God's word. Sometimes they were words of encouragement, and sometimes they were words of rebuke. And it came with unquestionable authority. But in the New Testament, we don't use that same language. Thus says the Lord. Rather, we say, this is what I'm sensing. I don't know if it's from the Lord. You pray and discern, and you leave it with the person. The key here is not to use manipulation. Unfortunately, that is how the gift of prophecy is abused. If somebody comes up to you and says, God wants you to do this, you better follow through, that is a wrong use of this gift. You don't tell people what to do. We don't use the language of thus says the Lord. You simply share the thought and leave it entirely to the person to decide whether it makes sense, knowing that you may be wrong. See, that is humility. First Thessalonians 5, 20 and 21, it says, Do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all. Hold on to what is good. So we are called to test prophecy. If it contradicts the written revelation of God's Word, you know that prophecy is not from the Lord. Clear and simple. Another way to test a prophecy is by sharing with another person whom you respect, whom you look up to as a spiritual leader, and they will be able to say whether this makes sense or not. Now, when these guidelines, these protocols are being followed, the gift of prophecy can be a tool God can use in the church to bless and build the whole body. Let's now move on to tongues, because that's another gift that often raises questions in church settings. What's the gift of tongues? And the first time we see tongues in operation is in Acts chapter 2. On the day of Pentecost, 
And 120 were gathered in the upper room. The Holy Spirit came, and they spoke in tongues. And here, it is clear in Acts chapter 2, they were foreign languages. People around them recognized what they were saying. That these were not languages that the people had learned. They were given supernatural ability to speak in a foreign language. Now, they didn't know what they were speaking, but others who recognized the language knew that they were praising God. So that is one way the gift of tongues is expressed. Ability to speak in foreign languages that a person has not learned. Now, every now and then you hear stories like these from the mission field especially in unreached parts of the world, where God gives the ability to somebody to speak in a language that they have not learned, but the other people group understand what is being communicated, and they end up placing their faith in Christ. It serves to advance the gospel mission. Now, can that happen today? It's rare, but it does happen. Our God is able to do that. Now, when you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, the tongues that Paul addresses here seem to fall under a different category. You know, the tongues that Paul addresses in 1 Corinthians 14 seem like a speech directed to God in prayer or praise, and it may be in a human language, or it may be not. Look at verse 2 of 1 Corinthians 14, what Paul is saying. For anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to people, but to God. Indeed, no one understands them. They utter mysteries by the Spirit. And Paul would go on to say, when, when there is nobody available to interpret this tongue, then people around who are sitting cannot understand what is being spoken. So Paul even says, visitors may come to a church gathering, may think that you're crazy, you've gone out of your mind. So in a corporate worship experience like this, tongues does not add much value. Now Paul writes in verses 18 and 19 of 1 Corinthians 14, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you, but in the church I would rather, give, I would rather speak five intelligible words to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. So here Paul himself says, I speak in tongues more than all of you. He exercised this gift personally. But in a public setting, it makes more sense that we do things that edify everybody else. Otherwise, it's the same as bringing somebody from a different language that we can understand to give the sermon. You know, that person may preach with a lot of passion, but if we don't understand the language, we won't benefit much from that. As you read 1 Corinthians 14, Paul is crystal clear. Without the gift of interpretation, tongues can serve to edify an individual in their own personal prayer time with God. And that's a place to use this gift for your own personal spiritual edification. If prophecy focuses on the building up of the church collectively, tongues often edifies the individual believer. A couple of things to clarify. Some churches teach that tongues is the evidence of being filled with the Spirit, that if you don't speak in tongues, you're not filled with the Holy Spirit. They view this as the hallmark of spiritual maturity. Now, I don't think that is scriptural. Tongues is one of the gifts of the Spirit. We don't all have this gift. Paul himself asks a, a rhetorical question in 1 Corinthians 12, 29 to 31. Paul says, are all apostles... Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? Now, eagerly desire the greater gifts. So there it is. Not everybody is an apostle. Not everybody is a prophet. Not everybody does miracles. Not everybody speaks in tongues. If God gives you the gift, then use it in accordance with the guidelines that the New Testament has outlined. If you don't have the gift, don't feel bad because God has given you something else that He wants you to use for His kingdom purposes. At the same time, here is a second clarification. We saw this clearly, that Paul himself spoke in tongues. And even though the Corinthian church had serious 
problems. They were abusing spiritual gifts. Yet, Paul did not stop the Corinthian church from speaking in tongues. He's merely saying, use them within the guidelines that have been set. Verse 39 of 1 Corinthians 14, he says, Therefore, my brothers and sisters, be eager to prophesy and do not forbid speaking in tongues. Tongues can be an effective prayer tool for some Christians to be used in private, but it's not for everyone, and it does not have a role in the corporate worship experience unless it's accompanied with interpretation. Now, let's move to the third sign gift, healing. And we believe God did not create physical sickness, that it came as a result of the fall of Adam and Eve. You know, sin entered into the world and it opened the gateway for sickness, disease, and death to come as well. Now, because Jesus died in our place, we have forgiveness from our sins and also the promise of eternal life. And we all look forward to the day when Jesus will return and He will remove all of the effects of the fall. The sickness and death will disappear from the face of the earth and we will be with the Lord when Jesus returns. The Bible presents this incredible imagery of a time that's going to come when Jesus returns and there will be no more sorrow, no more pain, no more sickness, no more death. And that is our ultimate hope that we are looking forward to. So when we see healing today, it is a foretaste of what is going to come. It's a pointer to the future reality that we are all awaiting when one day sickness will be totally vanquished. Supernatural healing is a sign that the kingdom of God is here in the now. It's alive and active. And we're also waiting for the full consummation, which will take place when Christ returns. Now, healings also served as a sign in the book of Acts to authenticate the gospel message. So, Christian missionaries at times receive the gift of healing when they try to reach unreached people groups, tough places where the gospel has not made inroads. And over the years, I have heard numerous testimonies of people coming to faith in Christ because they witnessed a physical healing. In places like India, where there are vast, unreached areas, God shows up in miraculous ways to get people's attention. And it results in blazing a trail. The doors start opening for the gospel to be preached, and that is the work of the Holy Spirit. And while God uses this gift of healing in other parts of the world, It appears they are rare here in the Western world. We don't know why. It's not something we can fully fathom. But our responsibility is to be prayerful, open, and receptive. So if God were to choose to move in the miraculous, we are not skeptical, but we are open and ready for that. God can give individuals gifts of healing to share the love of Jesus and preach the gospel message effectively. So healing serves as a means to a greater end. And the one with the gift of healing is not to be put on the pedestal. Don't call them faith healers because they are not the healer. God is the healer. They're simply instruments in His hands. It's unfortunate to see some who have the gift of healing, who make it all about themselves, that the spotlight is on them, and they build big ministries out of that. In fact, that can happen with any spiritual gift. The one with the gift of teaching can be revered in some circles to the point that they're seen as better off than others. But the spiritual gifts ought to put the spotlight on Christ and the power of the gospel to change lives. That's where all the action takes place. See, here's another clarification. Just because someone has the gift of healing doesn't mean that they can heal people at will. The apostle Paul clearly had the gift of healing, and God uses him in the healing ministry. But Paul could not heal Timothy from his stomach ailments, or Epaphroditus from his life-threatening sickness, or Trophimus, whom he left ill at Miletus. See, God is sovereign in this affair. Nothing is mechanical or automatic. 
A people with healing gifts don't wave a, a magic wand. They simply see greater success when they pray for people's healing because God chooses to use them in that way. So if you sense that you have that gift of healing, then a place for you to exercise that is the prayer ministry of the church. Now today's sermon may have raised a number of questions in your mind. You know, in the, with the limited time that I have, I'm not able to address all aspects. This is a very vast subject. So we're going to have some of our pastors here in the front to my right at the end of the service. So if you have questions or you just want to engage in further conversation, feel free to come up at the end of the service. We'd love to talk to you. But as we come to a close, I want to remind us, we are called not just to seek the gifts, but we seek the giver. The gifts are mere tools. God distributes it in line with His plans. And we want not just the gifts, but we want the giver because we realize the greatest gift that you can ever receive is the gift of His presence. A pursuing God above all else is the key to living the Christian life. So whatever our position on spiritual gifts may be, it is fitting to pray for a greater activity of the Holy Spirit in our midst. So let's admit, we all need more of God's presence. And ultimately, life change and life transformation does not happen through mere human efforts. All of our efforts will fail if it were to be upon us. But when the Holy Spirit of God comes, when He's moving actively in our midst, then life change and life transformation is the end result. So when we are hungry... And when we are thirsty, when we are seeking for more of God, when we call on His name, He delights to manifest His presence. Amen. So I want to give us an opportunity to do that, to express our longings, to express our desire to see more of God's activity in our midst. So I'm going to ask our worship team to come up and lead us in a closing song. But before they do, would you please stand? I want to give us a moment to just close your eyes and reflect on what you've heard and pray from your heart that God will do what He did in the book of Acts. You know, that ordinary believers came alive in their faith and the church turned the world upside down. You know, can that happen today? Yes. The same Holy Spirit of God is at work among us. And as we long for more of His presence, more of His power at work, and we will see the same results. So why don't we just close our eyes and in the quietness of this moment, express our longing for God. Express our desire to see Him at work in our lives, in our church, in our ministry areas, that we will see results that we can produce in our human strength. even as we wait in silence, I'm going to pray a historic prayer of the church. It's a simple prayer. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. For we need you. We cannot live our Christian life in our own strength. Come, Holy Spirit. So we receive power to be witnesses, to lift up the name of Jesus on high. Come, Holy Spirit, that with boldness and confidence we will be able to proclaim that Jesus is the only way to salvation. Come, Holy Spirit, and distribute all of the spiritual gifts that we need here at West Park to be the church that you have called us to be, to accomplish the things that you have in store for us. Come, Holy Spirit, to renew us and revive us, that those of us who are feeling dull in our Christian faith will encounter you and our lives will come alive 
that it'll be far from boring, that we will know that you've called us to be people on mission to serve you and lift up the name of Jesus on high. So come, Holy Spirit. We give you full control. Have your way. Establish your plans. We want more of you in our lives, in our church, in every ministry area here at West Park. I'm going to hand it to our worship team now to lead us in a closing song. Amen. Oh, we give God all the praise as we seek for more of Him, more of His presence and His activity in our church. As I said, our pastors will be available right here. So if you have any questions, want to have further conversation, you're most welcome to come up here. We also have a prayer team that will love to minister to you. I also want to remind you about this evening when we will all come together for our evening of prayer to collectively seek God's face. Oh, before we go, let me give you the benediction. Even as we all leave this place, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the love of our Heavenly Father and the sweet, unfailing fellowship of the Holy Spirit may rest and abide with each and every one of us, both now and forevermore. Amen. God bless you all.